Um, morning, I'm Zani, uh, and our first panel is going to sort of go straight to the crux of, uh, as Daniel laid out, what our theme is this today, which is really going from uh, responsibility to leadership. Everyone knows about corporate responsibility, it's a familiar concept to all of you, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't, but what is the boundary between responsibility and leadership? And it becomes a particularly pertinent question when political leadership falls short when governments and official sector leaders don't do what they ought to do to push a sustainability agenda, what is your responsibility? What is the responsibility of, what is our responsibility? What is everybody else's responsibility? At what point do businesses have to step up if politicians fall short? I think we see it particularly acutely now in the climate arena, uh, in the wake, as Daniel said, of the US decision. This is something that uh, a lot of businesses are grappling with, but I think it goes well beyond that agenda, uh, goes much further. And I think we have to start thinking about if we're really going to keep affecting change, what is the definition of responsibility and, and when does it morph into leadership and how does it morph into leadership and how do you do that? So that's kind of what I wanted to spend the next few minutes discussing with, I think, a, a superb panel to do that because we have representatives essentially from all sides of the debate. So, uh, and I'm going to go from the far end there, Mike Coop, CEO of Sainsbury's. Next to him, Commissioner Miguel Arias Cañete, who is Commissioner for Climate Change and Energy at the European Commission. And next to him, Jean-Marc Duvoisin, the CEO of Nespresso. And here, Aisha Imam, the Chair of the International Board of Directors of Greenpeace. So we have NGO, we have official sector, and we have two CEOs. Um, so let's start uh, with the official sector commissioner. Let's start with you. <laughs> what, um, first of all, on the assumption that some policymakers are falling short, what should businesses do? What do you see the role of business to be in this case? Well, uh, let's, frame, let's frame where we are. Okay, but don't go too far back. No, 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 no. I, I go okay. to the Paris Agreement. All right, good. Because we speak of the Paris Agreement, but what the Paris Agreement really means is that the transition to an absolutely decarbonized economy is unstoppable. And that's a shared project in which uh, uh, all the society is involved, business, uh, policy makers, uh, stakeholders. It's a common project, a common investment, and we are all together in it. That's, that's pretty clear. On one side, in some countries, policy makers are already doing what they should. In others, they are going in the opposite direction. Developing countries have problems of capacity uh, developing for, for implementing their indices. And there is a whole mix of, of possibilities. But if you ask me what is the difference between res corporate responsibility and leadership, it's pretty clear. It's how do you understand this transition? Is this transition a burden you have to comply with, we have to change, or is this a unique opportunity for being more competitive in a clean uh, energy scenario, in a decarbonized economy? And the leaders will be the sole, will be th those who conceive this as an opportunity for investment, for growth, for creating jobs. Those are the leaders of the future. Those who integrate in the business plans, who those who reduce the, the carbon footprint, those who have a positive view of this process, which is unstoppable. But do you think that in the light of, within the climate debate, in the light of uh, the absence of US policymakers, are you relying on more from business around the world than you were before? And what is it you need? When Mr. Trump in the Rose Garden launched such a negative message, in the beginning we were all uh, absolutely concerned and, and worried about the future of the Paris Agreement. There has been two very positive surprises. The first one is that no country has withdrawn from the commitments of the Paris Agreement after the Trump decision. It was a unique decision. The second is a big movement in the United States. A very big movement. Not on, first of all, starting with the mayors of more than 300 with cities, 12 states, starting with Jerry Brown in California and others. But the big surprise was the American business. We they created platforms, and the platform we are still in, more than 700 big, country, uh, big companies, all started having uh, more than half of them uh, climate targets, uh, reducing the footprints. So there is a movement in the American society to fulfill the targets that the federal government should have um, achieved. Uh, and that has been surprising, because it has been a, a simultaneous movement from the politicians on one side 
Politicians, have politicians have abdicated leadership. No, the, only the federal government. Uh, uh, oh, as, local politicians. As, com as Commissioner Jerry Brown says, if the federal government is on holidays, we will yeah. pick on the local developing climate policy as Absolutely. the cities, the states, and the business. Well, we will be talking more about city level later today. So that's yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Aisha Imam, let's let's start, let's go from the, the official sector to the to the NGO sector. What is your responsibility here? Is it to uh, cooperate with business or is it to, to shout at business? Well, I'm not going to speak for the whole NGO sector, but I will speak for Greenpeace International. And we have a principle that we have no permanent friends or permanent enemies. So sometimes we are cooperating with business, with government, and sometimes we're not. And so our role is in Greenpeace, we think first of all to highlight the issues that need attention, but secondly also to work on solutions. I think we're probably best known for the highlighting with the actions and the banners and so on, but there is a lot of work on solutions. That, if I go far back, simple things like developing uh, non free end gases for uh, fridge technology, which was developed with a small German company, made open source and is actually used now by almost all corporations that develop fridges. Okay, so that's one example of working with. Working against, okay, I will not look at anybody at the pa on the panel, <laughs> but we do have campaigns on particular issues that sometimes touch on particular companies. And if we win the campaign or if a, a company agrees to stop an unsustainable, pra unsustainable practice, no problem, we'll move together and we'll move forward. But specifically on the issue of leadership and <coughs> corporations, because corporations are so big, you know, the, the uh, top 100 economic entities, as you know, 69 of them are corporations, which means there are 160 countries, 164 countries that are smaller than the top 100 corporations. Yeah? So companies, because of their potential and their huge influence, have responsibility to do that. And that responsibility is not only around talking but it's also around, in my, work, in my opinion, leadership is around moving from talking about responsibility to modeling the way forward and to accepting accountability. So on accountability, it, you know, responsibility is, is welcome. But accountability is urgent because we are so close to the ecological limits. So we need to move faster. And if especially large corporations model the way, a lot of other corporations will follow. So there's not even the necessity always, it's better to have legal sanctions and legal pathways, but they're not required. One of them is about consistency, for example. If all corporations agree to the principle that they do not take up in other countries practices that avoid legal protections on pollution, on safety standards, on human rights that are forbidden in their home states, then that goes a long way across the world, particularly with multinationals. If companies take up <coughs> forward thinking, a th system of thinking about their production that is cradle to grave responsibility, how can we design our products that when they sold that we have clean supply, that we use renewable energy, that we have ethical practices in selling, that when they're used, they are possible to reuse, recycle, that they don't end up in trashes and landfills. That's going to go a long way to promoting sustainability. So, so let's, I will, in a second, I'm going to turn to the two CEOs to, to ask them to the react to that. But before, just, um, I, I think one should also ask what is the, to, for some accountability from the NGOs. So what is, of your two approaches, um, what is the one Greenpeace uses most, and which is the most effective? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you said earlier, the one people hear about most are the direct actions and the big campaigns. Um, but we get invited, for example, to Davos, to the Economic Summit, because people want to talk about, proactively, about how one can move forward, which is generally a quieter negotiation. So I don't think, I'm not saying that we can yeah. quantify it, but I do think that we need to have both avenues of action. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Um, Jean-Marc, let's uh, hear from you now. You've heard from the 
the political side or the official side and from the NGO side, what do you see? Uh, do you think leadership is re responsibility is morphing into leadership now? And what do you see? Lead what do you see your role being as a leader? Yeah, so, so um, I, I completely agree with with uh, Miguel. It's a responsibility of all. So companies cannot compensate the lack of responsibility of others. That's the first point. The second point, you said that uh, you know we were representing all the scope of, of people involved, and and I, I think what missing, but it's a theoretical missing, is that the consumer is not here or the public is not here. They're all here. Uh, yeah, but consumers for us. So consumers are very are key, because the consumers are the ones who put pressure on the companies to do the correct thing, and the consumers. Uh, can change uh, responsibility or sustainability and responsibility in a, in a competitive advantage. And this is where uh, it becomes so important, establishing new paradigm, new ways of working for the business. Uh, the pressure NGO put on us, or the government put on us, and the consumers is extremely important because it allows us to define how we should work. Uh, that's the first point. The second point also, uh, Miguel mentioned it, is that the companies or the future, the companies who can change responsibility in leaderships are the companies who embed sustainability in their business model. If you see sustainability as something you should do to compensate the negative impacts you have on, on society or on the environment, then you'll always have a change, you'll always have less pressure, then you can avoid doing it, or you can have sometimes very often a change of CEO who's not, who do, doesn't believe in that anymore. So that's why if it's embedded in your business model and if it's rewarded, recognized by the consumer, by the public, uh, by the governments and the NGOs, then, it, then you have a sustainable approach, a long-term approach to your new business model. And th this is why it's so, so important, I would say. It's, it's interesting that you mention consumers because there's now a lot of discussion about various stakeholders that you have to take into account. So there are consumers, but there's also employees. So for some of companies, course. employees are driving uh, the determination to push a sustainability agenda. So are you, and, and let's, and you, you, know, you have had an interesting case study in your company's history about a big shift um, in, in you know, a, lot of, a lot of outside concern about your commitment to sustainability. Uh, talk us through what were the drivers of change there? What was it that made you, you shift? And was it consumers? Was it employees? And, and how, did you, how did you, in your own case, go through the thought process that you just outlined? Yeah. Yes, I, I will talk basically of Nespresso, which is a yeah. part of Nestle, but it's a part which works only on coffee. But going back to your point on employees, it is obvious for me that if you want to attract millennials, if you really want to attract the best talent of the future, you need to have a very solid case in your sustainability impact. If not, you're just a company which is going to disappear because you won't be attracting the good people. That's the first point. The second point is, it, it, and this is why Nespresso is, very often they ask me, how, how come Nespresso embeds so much sustainability in our business model? It's because it's part of the model since the beginning. What, we, what happened was, is that we launched this coffee now 30 years ago, this new innovation, coffee and capsules. Um, and then it was a very big success since the year 2000. And it was growing extremely fast. And what we saw, and that was in 2003, that we would be lacking good quality coffee, basically. So we went out and connected. Now we have 75,000 farmers in our model, AAA model, which helps the farmers to produce better quality coffee, but also in a more sustainable way. Because we should make sure that we can have this quality coffee on the long run. So it is in, rooted in, in the requirement of having good quality coffee and making sure that we can you know, have traceability and connect with these farmers. So we have about 300, more than 300 agronomists helping these farmers to, to build a more sustainable coffee, coffee uh, industry. Coffee is very exposed. Some people say that by 2030 we won't have coffee anymore if we don't do a good work. Uh, so we need to work with them. So we have all these programs on, on shade, on, 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 on having trees, on working better the water, on having social sustainability, also treating better those people, just because it's the only way of having a long-term industry production of green coffee. But didn't you also have a shift, a, 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 a change in the terms of the recyclability of your capsule? Also. Yeah. That, 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 that was also. what I was thinking so, of. Yeah, so, on the so this is upstream. Downstream is the, is the recycling of the capsules. It is, hey, it is a responsibility, that's for sure. It is also, to go back to your theme, a leadership 
because if we lead in this category, in this recycling uh, requirement, then the others have to follow. Then everyone has to follow. And it's a way also to making sure that what we do on recycling doesn't become a, dis uh, a disadvantage competi competitiveness because others have to follow it because the public is requiring it. Uh, so in recycling, yes, we, we have now 90% of uh, options to recycle, offering to consumers all over the world, and it is again part of the model. We feel that we cannot offer aluminum capsules to, to consumers if we cannot also offer the way to recycle. Exactly. In so, way. so if you lead in it, you then set an industry standard, which means that you don't erode your exactly. competitive advantage. That's exactly Interesting. Right. Mike, um, what's your approach? I mean, you sell an enormous number of products. Um, where do you... What do you see your role in terms of leadership? Uh, do you, should you be pushing an agenda when political leaders fall short? If so, how? So uh, we, we have a, a vision to be the most trusted retailer where people love to work and shop. So that's our start point. Um, and um, the way I think about this is we're, generally speaking, uh, judged in the court of public opinion. And so most of the things, or a lot of the things that we do, go way beyond the legal minimums uh, that we're, we're required to um, achieve. And so uh, when we think about how we run our business, we have to think of it in terms of two dynamics. One is there are sustainable sources of competitive advantage by doing the right thing. Uh, and quite often what the right thing is might be different depending on somebody's frame of reference, which in and of itself creates a degree of greyness. What Greenpeace think is the right thing in some supply chains might be different to what other people might think, as, as an example. Um, but also a, a defensive approach. So if I take the last two weeks, just as a very good live example, we've gone from plastic packaging being the single lightning rod that's driving the UK's media agenda to trust in data. And we have to be able to cover both bases. I've gone from being asked on a regular basis what we're doing about plastics and plastic recycling, plastic usage, to suddenly it's what are you doing with the data that you collect. So we have to start from the point of view that we are judged in the court of public opinion and regardless of regulation and regardless of legal frameworks and legal minimums, we have to be able to say to our customers we are doing the right thing. And quite often on topics which are not top of their minds, quite often things which will suddenly rear their heads uh, in, in the public domain because another organization is being judged for not doing the right thing. Uh, the other point I make, we, we're talking about um, supranational corporations. Uh, one thing I am seeing, and I think it's a good thing, is that large corporations, and for the food industry, that's represented through a, uh, a, a, an organiza organization called the Consumer Goods Forum, are starting to get their heads around how we can create standards, which again uh, are way beyond the legal frameworks that exist across the globe, to join together sustainability standards uh, on a supranational basis, which I think is a good thing. And the refrigeration example is a very good example, because as an industry, the global retailers have signed up to a, to a, to a set of standards on refrigerants which are actually higher than the legal minimums in most countries. Um, and that's an example where companies are showing true leadership at, on a global scale. So, so that's really interesting. I mean, you give two, I mean, both, your, both your points are, uh, are, are, are very pertinent, but they're, are they slightly intentional with each other in the sense that if, you are, uh, if, if your main goal is to be sustainable in the court of public opinion, and public opinion, as you say, is fickle in terms of what it focuses on, does that mean you are essentially defensive in that you need to make sure that you've kind of ticked all the bases? On the other hand, your second point about you know, leading and setting standards that were not there, that politicians haven't come up with, that somewhat involves sticking your neck out and going further than people are already at. So how do you decide between those two? Well, great job. Um, yes, I mean, we have, to, we, we, we have to make conscious choices, some of which are very consciously on the basis of defense. So I could take you through our data policy. Um, that's something that's been developed over a number of years and is a, is a defendable document in the course of, court of public opinion. Uh, if I think of a different example, animal welfare, we are a company that's led in an animal welfare and go way beyond the minimum standards of UK legislation today and have done for decades. Um, if I take energy as an example, it's, a, it's another interesting um, case in point because 
uh, energy reduction is actually a commercial imperative as well as something which will lead to a, a more sustainable economy. And, and therefore, there's a, it's in the sweet spot of defensible, um, economically viable, but also... But that's, what you, that's the sweet spot. If you, if you go for something that ticks all three, then... then um, but you have to do it across... Yeah. There, is, there are many issues which we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, which would not be in, in the public realm as of today, but I'm pretty confident at some point in the future, there may be some... Greenpeace would have a very strong opinion on um, fishing, as a sustainable fishing, as an example. We're a big investor in uh, standards on fish. We comply with Marine Stewardship Council standards and have done again for 15 years. And it will only be when there's the Channel 4 expose or the, um, you know, the Blue Planet um, documentary that that issue will be raised in public consciousness. And our customers will have expected us to have done the right thing. They won't know necessarily what it is, but they will have expected us to do it. So I'm going to go in a second and ask, because I'm sure there are many of your customers here broadly, ask for some questions <laughs> oh, and comments so. from the floor. <laughs> but Commissioner, first... They're all wearing yellow... Uh, no, not... Sorry, uh, orange... Yellow uh, what? What are we uh, supposed uh, to be wearing? Sorry, orange... I thought they were orange lanyards, but obviously not. I got this in the light. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, you've, you've heard now from two CEOs and, and from Greenpeace. You're at the table where many of these policy discussions take place. What are the two or three most useful contributions that particularly the two CEOs or the industry more broadly can make to leading for you? What, what is it, I mean, you mentioned climate and you said that, that businesses had stepped up, but where are the areas, can you point to concrete areas where actually businesses can really show leadership and go beyond the politicians? There is a very, there is a very clear area. If you see, uh, under the Paris Agreement, the commitments made by the parties, 175 of them put on the table national determined contributions. That means actions for mitigation, adaptation, and that requires investment. The investment needed to achieve the targets uh, on the table now, which are insufficient to cope with global warming, is the first step, will require investment around $90 trillion. That can never be done by public finance. Never. It requires investment from the private sector. For sure, it requires um, regulatory uh, um, stable frameworks. That, that's another, and the World Bank is doing a lot on this issue. That's, that's one thing. The second thing, probably that we speak less about, is um, that uh, the transition to, to a decarbonized economy requires also a change um, uh, of behavior in citizens. And that behavioral citizens, which NGOs try to develop, if you see the big multinationals are the biggest advertisers of the world, they have a huge possibility to produce that behavioral change that will be needed in a, in, in a, in a decarbonized economy who has energy efficiency should be the policy number one. And, and so multinationals can do many things. Uh, they, they can lobby governments of, in developing countries, but they can change the behavioral pattern. When you see the advertisement, you can do it in many ways different. And the advertising capability of the multinational touch all the citizens. And that's something that we have to explore in the future because we will put policies. Uh, we will develop targets. But in the end, if the consumers don't embrace the revolution to a, to a, to a decarbonized economy themselves, it will be more complicated. So that's another very positive thing. I'm going to ask the two CEOs about that in a second. But Aisha, first, you wanted to make a point. I did. I wanted to talk a little bit about... Uh, corporate leadership and policies and government regulations. And one of the things that it is in the interest, actually, of the, of the corporates who do have high standards and sustainability to make sure that the legal standards, to put your clout behind the legal standards, it, it, it also helps your competitiveness, if you like. But because the obverse is, and we see it very clearly, the corporate lobbying of, let's say, the fossil fuel industry that has for years been obfuscating the realities of climate change and using their massive corporate power in lobbying governments, in advertising and so on to do that. So I think there there is a role for corporates to push for better standards and rather than only leave corporate lobbying, in the rest of our minds at least, the people, the consumers, yeah, they're only trying to get 
tax dodges. Yeah, they're only trying to defend their own narrow interests, then they don't have the interests of, of people, the planet, you know, this, the future at heart. So that's one area in which I think businesses could definitely take leadership. And the other is, um, referring to the, to the people power, it is ex exactly around whether you call everybody consumers or everybody people and people power movement. It is, it is as you said, exactly around the need for people to understand better, mobilize better, and have transparent information. And there again, it'd be really nice if corporates were transparent about their data, their effect on the environment. Um, one, because we need accurate information to implement the, the Paris agreements and, and so on. But two, it'd be really nice if corporates would say when they see a problem, when the data show a problem in their environmental impact, right, we're going to fix that, as opposed to, oh my god, we're going to hide that. <laughs> two, that's, that's very interesting. So Jean-Marc, you've had two sets of recommendations from, from the official sector and from, uh, from the NGO sector. You should push governments towards better standards, and you should try and change the behavior of citizens towards a more no, sustainable... No, I, I, I fully, I fully um, agree with this. I mean, you mentioned before, if we have defensive uh, communication when we are attacked on, on plastic, on data, every, every two weeks you have a new one. If you, first of all, you need an internal plan. You need your plan. You need to have it shared with all the employees. And then you need to proactively go out and communicate. That's where you change responsibility, which is the first part of it, having a plan, to leadership where you start communicating and talking out on what you're doing. And then you start leading. And then you, when you should react to a crisis or to an impact, you can react. But at least you, have, you know what you are doing. You know where you're going. You know what, how your impact is, how you can make it, mitigate it, and how you can bring positive impact. And by um, going to your, your point on, on communicating, companies have to communicate much more on what they are doing. And then you have a lot of pressure. You have a lot of people questioning you, you questioning your plan, uh, you know, challenging you to do even better. But you have to go out and, and establish a positive discussion on sustainability topics and also on, on social responsibility top, topics, on uh, how you treat people, how you treat workers, how the farmers work in your but, coffee. But should you go? It's one thing to, to push a responsible discussion. No. It's another. And I think both the commissioner and Aisha were saying push people to change their behavior, yeah. encourage your customers to change their yeah. behavior. Is that, Mike, is that? Uh, well, I, I think it's, um, it's very interesting. So having tried many interventions, overt in interventions to help uh, inform customers about choices they're making, health would be the very good, easy one to illustrate. If you asked anybody on the street today um, how to live a healthier life, basically eat less and exercise more, it, people would know that actually changing behavior. So they'll be able to tell you what it is that they would need to do, but actually changing behavior is notoriously difficult. Uh, and in the take health as an example, in the end, it will be stealth interventions which probably have the most impact. Uh, and the best example I can give in, a, in the UK food industry is reducing salt in food, which ultimately has led to a measurable reduction in strokes. And I'm sure the same will, will, will be true of sugar reduction leading to a, a lowering of childhood obesity. But it's really, really, really difficult to, to change people's behavior, because most people live in the here and now and don't think about some of the longer term issues. So the responsibility or the leadership comes from businesses like ours, going back to the doing the right thing and leading the agenda and actually in lots of cases making stealth choices that are not always obvious to our customers until after the fact. Um, I agree on the point about transparency. The only challenge with transparency, it becomes a stick with which you're beaten. Um, and so Greenpeace, when they find stuff out, um, may well turn the debate on its head. And that's something you have to be very thoughtful about when you publish open and transparent data. And believe me, I spend my life lobbying governments about, if I take plastic packaging as an example, I would argue it's a failure of public policy that we don't have a unified recycling policy in the UK. And therefore, if you're a retailer, you don't stand a chance because every single local authority has a different approach to plastics recycling. Uh, and unless there's a, a framework for the whole of the UK, it is impossible to solve the problem. And I make that very clear to politicians, but they abdicate responsibility down, further down the, the food chain. So you have to have certainly local frameworks, and I would argue European or global frameworks, in order to make these types of things work. On that and, note, and let's put together the businesses that are forward-looking, with the people power, with the NGO power, with, the, with people like the commissioner, 
to push that, that so that on, on data, for example, if everybody had been transparent, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be the people who are already trying to do something who'd get the stick. Well, give, so that, I, I, that's I will, why we need the frameworks. I'll give you a good example. So, so. so I've, in the UK, the leaders of food, food business in the UK have agreed that we will have a common way of measuring food waste. Getting to an agreement about what that is, how to do it, and then getting everybody to do it is an enormous undertaking. And that's just one example of a relatively closed um, loop supply chain. Yes, we'll get there, true. but it will probably take three to five years to get everybody to a common standard. And you're doing that outside of government? Yeah, of course. Uh, you, you, you've got to remember, the government, all the government does is set a, in most cases, set a minimum set of standards. And if I took most of the things that we do in our organization, that's not the lens through which we look at things. We have to be judged by a, a different standard, especially in the world that we live in today. As I say, the court of public opinion, ultimately, that we have done the right thing. Can I make one more? Can, yes, very briefly, because I do want to open it to questions. Okay, I just wanted to make one more point about pushing people and making people change. I think the other way of looking at it is enabling the choices for change, That's because right. it's no point saying to people, be healthy if all you have is fast food, or, or that's what's available at the prices you can afford. So I think that it's not so much pushing people, it's enabling people to understand the power of their choices, but also the power of how they can push for things that are better. Uh, uh, take, for example, the energy sector. Yeah. We have always have passive consumers. They just pay the bill, a bill that they didn't understand, a clue, because the bill was very complicated. Now we want to have active consumers consumers who are able to produce their own energy, sell their own energy, and buy the energy at the right time with the smart meters uh, from uh, apes. That's a, that's a big change. If you are able to buy your, your uh, energy when it's low price, if you are able to, uh, to set up all the appliances of your house with an APP, that's a change of conduct. Uh, because if you arrive to a house, all the lights are, are, are on. Uh, if you are able to regulate the, the, the heating of your house at the moment you are, have available energy, that's a change of behavior. So companies involved in energy should also have become very active with the consumers to become then prosumers uh, and not passive consumers. And Pros they will prosumers. Always, eh? prosumers. Prosumers. Very good. Thank you. Let's open up to questions or comments. Yes. Nick Davis from um, There's a microphone right yes. there. Nick Davis from Mabley. Um, there's been lots of talk for years about businesses unified force for good and unification, collaboration is clearly going to get more things done. But most brands aren't really at a place yet where marketing is taking that leadership role in trying to move people towards engaging. What do you think needs to happen in order to get marketing to start taking that leadership role when so much change is already happening within the business? I think that's a question for our two CEOs. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll go in a very specific uh, example with, with my company. Uh, Nespresso ha had, has who had a very premium positioning, and you had George Clooney up there and, and doing a, a lot of uh, premiumization of the brand. And when I wanted to start to talk about sustainability, which was four or five years ago, we had this dichotomy of people thinking Nespresso was a luxury brand. And it was difficult to match with farmers and, and people in you know, dirty boots doing the job and in producing uh, green coffee. So how could we link both? And this is what we are trying to do. And I must say, it is working even better than what we thought. What we did was to use George Clooney, especially on the digital, uh, digital communication uh, sites, to talk about sustainability and having George talking about how we can do a positive difference and how by drinking a, a good coffee uh, through Nespresso you help the farmers to live better. Uh, so this is really working extremely good. And now, uh, in the la last November, we started to put it on mass media and on TV, a commercial where you see George Clooney linking with farmers. And this is what we should create in the mind of the consumer, is seeing that when he, ha when he consumes, he has an impact. He can have a positive impact or negative impact. And this is why I come back to my having it embedded in my business model, because I know that I can, I, if I do much better than others, and consumers look for the, pimp, the company who do better, then they will come to Nespo. So it's also a positive, I would say, uh, business uh, impact. Um, now I also, and this is why I'm quite optimist, is that the, the, gen, the new generations are changing. And when you go to young people, you know, up to, up to 25, 30, they really want to consume in a, in a good way now. 
this is really changing very fast. We knew, and, and as companies that a few years ago, when you talked about sustainability, you knew people, you asked people, they said, yes, I will buy this brand, but at the end, they didn't buy this brand. They went to the cheapest or the best. But now, this is changing. So it is, it is, and we should leverage this. We should use this wave of positive millennials wanting to make a change. And this, that's why I'm, I'm quite positive. Optimist. Thank you. Mike? Mike my son. Uh, well, our brand promise is live well for less. Uh, it's, the words are deliberately ambiguous because for less can mean a number of things. For less, obviously financially less, but also we would argue less impact. Um, live well um, can mean a lot of things as well. Live well healthily, eating, quality, etc., etc. So we start with our, our brand promise, our consumer facing <laughs> promise, and build our advertising and marketing programs around that, uh, around those headlines. So I would argue that our model is integrated in the way that you're alluding to um, from bottom up in terms of the, the way that we source the products that we sell, the way that we run our shops, the way we engage with our employees and top down in the way that we present our brand to our customers. Um, so I'd like to think we don't always get it right, but I'd like to think we're pretty consistent. Sadly, we don't have George Clooney, but hey, we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Next question or comment. Everybody, my glasses on. Yes. Uh, Mark Stevens from the Global Resilience Partnership. I was interested in the example of um, um, retailers coming together to reduce food waste um, in the supply chain. I wondered what the kind of concrete mechanism uh, was that achieved that, and whether, it, whether, you, whether it's replicable in other sectors or not. Um, I, what we're, we're coming together on the measurement of food waste. So, so um, we agree that there's a, there is a commonality of need to be able to publish data on, on a, an agreed set of standards. And if you want to be blunt, it's Dave Lewis and I sitting down together and saying, wouldn't this be a good thing to do? He, he's leading the um, UN sustainability goal for food reduction. Our business has uh, done a lot of work on food waste and how we can do a better job of reducing uh, the impact of food waste in our supply chains. And if the two biggest retailers in the UK get together and decide it's a good thing to do and agree what the standards are, um, through the auspices of the industry body, the IGD, um, then ultimately that becomes a platform which other people will then come on the journey. So it comes, down, it comes back to the leadership point. In the end, it's two of the business leaders um, getting around the table and saying, we're measuring it in different ways. We need to join this together. How? And then giving our teams the task of actually going through the mechanisms of making that happen. It's not easy. It is not easy, uh, if that's just a very simple example. But, so that suggests if you're a, a leader in your sector, you have a particular responsibility for leadership. Mm -hmm. so the the uh, big, uh, in terms of actually changing, game-changing interventions, the biggest multinationals, the biggest players in a particular industry are the ones with the greatest responsibility. Yeah, my, my, uh, I have to say my experience of the CEOs that I interact with and work with is that there is a, a shared and common understanding of the things that we are trying to achieve. Not always how to get there, there's not necessarily a common understanding, but if I take, if I take refrigerants as an example, the global retailers, or rather the forum that represents retailing throughout the globe, agreed a set of common standards which were for some of them, financially disadvantageous um, because the technology wasn't quite right and some countries are hotter than other countries, so you need a different um, level of power to run CO2 refrigerants, et cetera, et cetera. If I take food waste as an example, I suspect the UK will be at the leading edge of measuring food waste and possibly even dealing with food waste. And I would imagine over time that the, the standards we adopt in the UK will become a platform on which the CGF, the wider retailing and manufacturing environment will work. So the UK, the UK, it has to be said on a lot of these topics, is at the leading edge uh, of thinking and, and can be very influential in the way that some of these things get developed on a, on a global basis. Thank you. I think there was a question up there, yes. Uh, yes. Um, Carl Pedro from Skyline Mining. I have a, a question. Could you introduce yourself? Sorry, Sorry. I'm Carl Pendragon from Sky Mining. I would like to ask a question to both Mike and Jean-Marc, um, and you can choose who answers it. Um, why do we seem to always be waiting for legislation before we take action? I mean, the corporations that you both represent make billions of dollars of profits. France, for example, Not has quite. recently passed a law to forbid food waste, and all uh, waste uh, from well, supermarkets... Oh. Sorry, sorry, I just well, don't agree with the premise of the question. Exactly. Uh, I've, just, I've just explained to you, on, on virtually every front I can think of, 
We are leading the agenda, not following the agenda. We also don't make billions of dollars of profit, by the way. Just I make two and a half percent on my sales. So broadly right. speaking, so, um, so, I'm so, a, so, but my point is this, for example, the technology exists to make completely biodegradable plastic bags. Um, why don't we just make them? And, and if it costs two pence more, uh, the technology exists to, to uh, get rid of, uh, for example, the capsules that okay. are made from plastic. So, 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 so let's, 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 let's do that before it's a law. That so, so let's, so let's, let's, take, take, let's, let's take, take that those as an concrete example. Ones. Let's take so those so concrete ones. we live in a, Sainsbury's sells 250 million things a week, single items quarter of a billion things. Many of our suppliers have a huge amount of embedded capital in machinery um, that they have invested over, over decades. Um, and to change the substrates of plastics, as an example, or packaging, will require a huge amount of investment over time. Uh, and will take um, decades, if you want to be blunt. You can change some things immediately, and there are certainly things that we can do as a business to reduce the impact uh, of plastics in our business and the environment more, more generally. But you know, it's naive to think that somehow you can switch on recycled plastics overnight as a way of, of solving a, a broader problem because of the amount of embedded capital in a very, very efficient uh, and very long, uh, highly invested supply chain. Thank you. John, yeah, just, I briefly. Also, I also disagree with the, the mention that we only follow the, the requirements of the state. I think we are much more proactive, and we like establishing what we feel we should be doing. Um, and, and this is the way forward. It's the leadership is when we define how we should be working in a, in a positive way. Now, on, on, because you mentioned recycled uh, capsule, plastic capsules, we exactly remained on aluminum capsules, not only because it offers the best quality in the coffee, but also because it is the best recyclable solution. Aluminium is much better to be recycled than any plastic uh, capsule. So, you know, we stuck two capsules in aluminium, even if all others were in plastic, because from the sustainability point of view, it's a, more, it's a better solution. Thank you. Then there's a last question from the lady here. Um, I just want to say, my name is Justine Mudrod, Center for Synchronous Leadership. Uh, I love the idea of corporations coming together to push for better regulation or coming together to raise the standards. My question is, is there an inherent tension there? Um, because often when corporations do lead and do the right thing, they want a competitive advantage as part of the justification for that. So is there a tension in then coming together with your competitors and actually pushing for higher standards? I guess that gets to a point you were making earlier, Mike, about the sweet spot between things that work. I can't remember if you were yours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, 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 both gave you an advantage and showed you were a leader and were what your customers wanted. Yeah, I mean, I, I tried to make a distinction between how, you know, how we would think about um, these big issues. So there are some clear areas where there is room for competitive advantage, which are um, good in terms of sustainability and have an economic benefit to our organization. And I would use energy as an obvious example of that. Sainsbury's consumes. Um, almost 1% of the energy in the UK, that has to be a good thing if we can reduce our energy consumption and use less of it. Um, equally, if I took data as an example, um, it's not necessarily quite in the sustainability camp, but having a set of robust and uh, transparent and defendable data standards is a, is a protection in the court of public opinion and I would argue that some of the things we've done are, the, are at the leading edge of trust, but I don't think that's possible to explain or be tra transparent or, or even be a source of competitive advantage. And it's only in situations where it suddenly becomes a, a red hot topic in the court of public opinion that you're able to say, well, actually, our customers can, can trust us to use their data in the right way. And that's quite a brave thing to say. Um, but if you, you have to be able to back that up, because if you say it and you're wrong, then, boy, you're going to suffer um, in, the, in the course of public opinion. Aisha, and then the, all three of you get the last word, but let's go start here. I just wanted to talk about the setting of standards. I think it is imperative that we all, different fields, start setting standards without waiting for government, although hopefully we will bring government, and in, in some places government does take a pre proactive step, okay? It's not all context. But I, whilst I welcome the idea that 
forward-looking industries would start working on standards. I think it's also important to bear in mind that those standards also need to be vetted in the long run by, do they fit by the scientific data, if we're talking about sustainability? Are they also what people understand and want? And that, that's where you also have a role for independent um, bodies, for working with public opinion, for providing information about it. So that's what I would say about standards. Okay. Thank you. Jean-Luc, and then the commissioner ends. No, I think to, go, yeah, sorry. Uh, to go back to your point, I think it's very interesting, the tension. It is true, there is a tension. So you define what's pre-competitive, and what's pre-competitive and you should work on is what can impact the industry as such, and then you work all together. And then you, d and, and then you look at where you have a competitive advantage. For instance, our relation with our, our farmers is, I feel it as competitive, because I can access the best quality coffee. So that's where I, don't, I want others to do the same thing, but on their farms. So it is, it is a question of understanding well everything, all the tensions around you, and how you can manage them. But typically, and, and I think this is a, uh, my, my, my last comment is that you can see that the companies or the states or the politicians, when they have a long-term view on things, they align behind sustainability goals. If they have only a short-term view, and this is for politicians, governments, or, or even companies, if they have a short-term view on things, then they can impact negatively the environment. And, and I would say the big change is this. Look at long-term and short-term and see how people act versus this. The last word's yours, very briefly. That's why um, we in the European Union have long-term vision. Mm. We are fixing, <laughs> no, we are fixing standards, we are fixing targets for 2030, and we will produce a mid-century decarbonization strategy with milestone, so that industry has predictability. But, uh, but coming back to standards, there is an area and where there is always tension between business and, and, and politicians, is the CO2 standards of cars and light vans. Then when you fish standards of the industry, say they are impossible, they are expensive, we will not get them, and there is always a, a how I say, tension uh, fixing those standards. On the other side, there is an area in standards are a success in eco design of domestic appliances. That has been a success story because the European standards have become world standards. The eco labeling is accepted by consumers, and consumers demand products will, will have less consumption of energy, long-lasting life, and that has been a success story fixing the standards. That's an excellent place to end. One area where there's still a lot of challenges, one area which is a clear success. Thank you all very much indeed, and now over to Daniel for a panel on cities.